All right, here we go. Uh, let's try to take a look at imperialism in India. Um, not only will I use this lecture to give us an intro into how imperialism rolled out and affected India, but I'm also going to introduce some concept on what imperial rule looked like and how it affected things such as food production and poverty levels and um, just some of the basic strategies that we see the Europeans use to um, change the politics in their various colonies. So let's do this. As a bit of review, we know that the Europeans have been inching into India for a long period of time. The French, the Portuguese, the British, and others, um, but mostly them, had influence around the Emporia or those port cities around India for a long period of time. Um, but uh, the British slowly gained more and more influence, especially through the British East India Company. Right, We should be familiar what that was. Um, and then after the Seven Years' War, um, the Brits are pretty much the only European power that will have uh, influence in the, the region. So it's not new that the Europeans are there. Um, but as we've seen in uh, other time periods, the um, the weakness, the political weakness of India at this point, just like we've seen, for example, the political weakness of Mesopotamia at a certain point as it allowed the Persians to take over, um, the political weakness of India as we approach uh, the 1700s allows uh, for the British to take over. Um, Shah Aurangzeb, as we've discussed before, is known to have persecuted the Hindus and Sikhs um, and uh, just have to uh, install harsh rule because things were growing to be quite unsettled, a lot of civil wars. Um, and if people were unhappy with their central government, they turned to their rich economic ally, the Brits, and so they um, are gaining even more influence over the region. Um, it should also be um, noted uh, that there is a major Hindu uprising um, called the Maratha um, Uprising, the Maratha Empire, um, that uh, will briefly take over what is this political vacuum after the death of Aurangzeb, um, which can pretty much mark the end of the Mughal Empire. Um, so the Mughals are no longer centrally ruling, and so we are even more fragmented than before, although we do have this really rebellious empire takeover in the northern section of India. Um, so the Maratha are known um, as, uh, as this proto-natalist, as I say here, um, warlike caste, very rebellious. So generally Hindu soldiers, but in particular um, uh, championing the farmers and the laborers. So they're taking over the northern section as the south now is really fragmented and even more vulnerable right, to British influence. Um, so as we approach the 1850s, this is kind of the breakdown um, of um, politics and uh, influence in India. Right? So the Maratha um, have most of northern and central India, whereas most of the um, south and the um, eastern coasts of India have been heavily influenced by the British East India Company. So at this point, um, the British East India Company and thus Britain has more of an economic influence and via that political influence over India, but it is not a direct colony. Um, but there was discontent rising as the Brits began to have more and more influence. So as the Brits um, remain there, they're not just trading. They're starting to build things like infrastructure. They're starting to move some of their own people there um, and just invest in India. Um, and even though some Indians enjoyed some of the modernizations and new technologies that the Brits were bringing, um, others perceived the Brits as a threat not only to Indian culture, um, but to the sovereignty, because they, the Brits started to pass laws in some cases. So for example, um, when the Brits uh, first um, encountered an example of sati, which we studied at the beginning of the year, they were horrified and started to write about it in their newsletters back home, and there'd be all these exposés about it in British newspapers. Um, and of course they exaggerated it, as, um, as you can imagine, um, not only a bit maybe out of shock because they hadn't seen anything like that, but also as we saw in the case of Latin America. Yes, the Aztecs were horrible in terms of um, human sacrifice, and that was a brutal process, but the Spanish definitely inflated the numbers to justify taking these people over. Similarly, the Brits will start this campaign to paint the Indians as barbarians who burn widows um, in order to justify um, having more people stationed 
uh, in India to save them right from their barbaric actions. It also justified bringing Christianity more into the region because if Hinduism could justify widow burning, then it must be a terrible religion. And of course, they need this European religion, Christianity. Right. So more missionaries begin to show up. There's also a class of people called the sepoys, um, which are uh, soldiers that are employed by the British Empire. So these are Indian soldiers of various faiths and backgrounds, um, but most of them are Muslim and Hindu. Um, they are working for the Brits. They're getting paid very well. And originally, um, they generally are working within India. Um, but then they begin to issue uh, these... Um, uh, you know, these laws that said that the sepoys would have to move about the British Empire. And this, as we discussed before in class, this is when we start to see some Indians uh, forced to move outside of India. Right? So they start to move them to South Africa and Kenya and um, parts of their other um, uh, Southeast Asian empires. Um, and for some uh, Indians, this was seen as a great affront because if they had to move, not only is that just upsetting because you're leaving your family. Um, but for some Indian communities that was seen as against their caste, um, to, to leave right without, um, I don't know, their, uh, special spiritual permission. Um, but there was also a moment, uh, it's often known as this like coup de grace, this like final straw, um, that really set the sepoys off. And that's when they, um, recognized that the British, greased, I should say grease, uh, greased their cartridge tips um, for their ammunition with animal fat. And in order to um, kind of use the cartridge, you would have to use your mouth to open it up, um, which would mean that Muslims and Hindus were inadvertently eating, you know, pig and cow fat, and many of whom adhered to strict diets that didn't allow them to eat those types of foods, right? Muslims don't eat pork, and many Hindus adhere to vegetarian diets. And the Brits just either didn't know that, which shows that we have these foreigners with no cultural competency um, ruling our nation, um, or they just didn't care, right, which is even worse. And so there's a lot of long-term reasons, but the all this stuff leads to what's known as the Great Indian Rebellion of 1857. Um, and this moment is a transition point between when the Brits have uh, indirect economic influence over India um, to eventually direct colonial rule. Um, and the way people refer to this event often tells you where they stand in this moment. Uh, so by calling it the Great Indian Rebellion of 1857, we're kind of recognizing, um, you, know, the re you know, the idea of rebellion is that people are fighting against something and that there's some legitimacy to their cause. Um, it's also known as the Sepoy Rebellion, which sometimes is only looking at um, part of the rebellion, which of course were those sepoys or uh, the soldiers employed by the Brits. But the rebellion was larger than that. Um, some people refer to it as the Great Indian Mutiny. And if they're referring to it as the Great Indian Mutiny, that is um, intimating that they believed that the Indians did not have the right to challenge the Brits, or that they were kind of pro-British in their political perspective. So we'll have to keep our eye on that because this is a very complicated situation. Um, so the Great Indian Rebellion of 1857 um, did last for a couple years. Um, they did uh, uh, initiate the rebellion with a proclamation very similar to like the Declaration of Independence or the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, like we saw in the French, um, French Revolution. Um, one figure I want to introduce you to, just because I think it's really interesting and just shows you the widespread nature of this moment, is Lakshmi Bai. Um, who was a leader in the north of the northern one one of the northern sections of the Great Indian Rebellion? Um, she uh, had inherited a great swath of what was Maratha territory um, from her late husband, um, and she was respected as a female leader. And when the Brits tried to force her to give up her land um, through all this kind of shady dealing, she refused to do so and helped to lead part of the rebellion. Eventually, dying fighting the Brits. Um, so challenging some of the widely accepted beliefs about gender um, in India, first and foremost, and also just um, looking at the widespread nature of the rebellion. Um, and uh, one of the, for the Indian perspective, celebrated war heroes, um, and of course, of the British perspective, um, an enemy. Um, so here we have just, you know, an illustration of the Sepoy Rebellion. Um, so uh, uh, there's some elephants there, and it looks like pretty tense, pretty brutal. 
But let's look at the effects because uh, I don't want to drag this on too much because we've got a lot going on here. Um, so the result is that the British win, right, which shouldn't be a surprise, um, even though the Indians absolutely put up a fight and um, had some key victories. In the end, the British win. Um, and now the Brits don't trust that they can conduct business with the Indians without some sort of political challenge. So they'll institute um, direct rule uh, in India. Um, they're going to force the Indians to pay taxes. Um, they're going to change everything. All right? And so now we have entered into what's called the British Raj. Oh, this is a particularly harsh image. This is an image of some of the key leaders of the rebellions um, being punished by being strapped to cannons. Um, and then the cannons, of course, were fired. So you can imagine that that was um, a really dreadful death. So um, this is, like I said, complicated. Um, some Indians view the Brits as great civilizers, as bringing these amazing advancements to their country. But of course, there's tons of evidence to show that the British could be quite brutal um, and were particularly could be particularly brutal in India because India was so important to them. Uh, centrally located, had amazing resources, um, so they really did not want to let go of this empire or this um, colony. Um, so the period of British direct rule in India is known as the British Raj. Um, they'll take that name, the British Raj, um, so they'll um, kind of co-opt this uh, Indian term um, to mean princes, as we've used before in our studies of Indian history, um, to talk about their direct rule, right, to further legitimize it. Um, at this point, too, many Brits begin to emigrate to the region. Um, and I'll show you some images of that, um, some images that were circulating to try to get people to want to move there, um, just to further dig British, you know, heels into Indian soil. Um, and also, we're going to see that some Indians were privileged and were used to administer um, for the British government within India and elsewhere. Um, these are a group of people that I often term the imperial pets um, and uh, are part and parcel of the political dynamics of how the Brits ruled over their colonies, but we should note that a lot of Europeans did this wherever they might have ruled. Uh, this is an interesting image as well. This is um, a trading card that you would have found in a pack of cigarettes. Uh, in, um, I, I don't know what the, the cigarette brand is called, but it was like a collect -em all series, and it showed Queen Victoria, right, the Queen of England at the time. Um, and it's kind of difficult, difficult to see at the bottom there, but it says, Souvenir po Portrait of Her Most Gracious Majesty, Queen Victoria, Empress of India. So all these cards showed her with her new title over whatever colony, right, that they might have conquered, right, whether it was a section of Africa, uh, whether it was India, Australia, um, some of the Pacific Islands, etc. Um, so just a point of pride that the sun never sets on the British Empire. This is another image uh, that I think is quite telling of things going on. Um, so this is Viceroy Lytton or Lytton or however you say his name in 1877, um, flanked by some of his Indian guards who look like they're dressed very well. I'm sure they're paid very handsomely by the British government. Um, he's sitting in a uh, Calcutta, and I want you to recognize that Calcutta um, was the capital of the British Raj, so the seat of government of the British. Um, that's going to be important when we look at the distributions of some goods later on. Um, but here we can see that some of these um, Indians, these Indian guards here, were quite complicit in supporting um, the British government. Um, it's a pretty obnoxious stance of this uh, vice right here. Um, I want to introduce you to a couple other gentlemen um, who would have benefited greatly from British rule. Uh, so here we see a collection of individuals, um, Nawab Mohsin Omuk, um, Sir Saeed Ahmed Khad, and Justice Saeed Mahmoud. Um, these are uh, individuals um, who you know, did fairly well under the British government. Um, we can see their, via their dress, and we should take note of how people dress, um, both a combination of a retention of whatever their Indian identity might be. Um, in this case, we see that there are definitely some Muslims who are most likely from what is um, now considered Pakistan today. But they've also adopted some Western dress. Um, so um, Justice Saeed Mahmoud, um, all the way right over here, um, is, is fully adopting Western dress. So he has a Western style hat in his hands. He's got a suit on. They all have like polished Western styled shoes. Um, and that can be an indication, right, that they were faring well under the Brits and they supported them. Um, 
if we go kind of left to right here, um, Sir Saeed Ahmed Khan uh, protected the British during the Great Rebellion. Um, so he worked with the British and he wrote an essay, a critique, and he named it The Causes of the Indian Mutiny. So you can see via his um, uh, the title right here, right? If he's calling it the Indian Mutiny, he is um, supporting the Brits, saying that the Indians didn't have the right um, to to challenge the, the British rule in that moment. Khan is also one of the first um, to offer the idea of a two-nation theory, that so long as the Brits rule over this region, and if ever they did grant um, autonomy back to India, that they should separate India into two states, one Muslim state and one Hindu state. And that's exactly what happens after independence, right? So very early on, these theories emerge. Um, and uh, where is he? Um, Justice Said Mahmoud um, served in the high court um, under the British Raj, so what would be kind of similar to a Supreme Court setting. Um, it should also be noted uh, that Sir um, uh, Sayyid Ahmed Khan, I mean, he's, he had the title Sir, which means he was knighted, right? So it's, a, it's pretty privileged. Um, and generally speaking, we're only really seeing Indian British colonial subjects um, be offered these types of, of honors, such as being knighted, or um, being allowed to study in British universities. Uh, Indians were given the greatest privileges of any of the other uh, major colonies, um, and we'll watch how that complicates uh, the dynamics in this region. Um, another group of people that could have, that were often highly privileged under the Brits were the Gurkha soldiers or the Gurkha brigades. Um, the Gurkha were Nepalese soldiers that the British were very impressed by because the British couldn't beat the Nepalese in the 1814 war to try to take Nepal. They kind of had a call to draw um, and via these negotiations give the Nepalese like a ton of power and specifically employ the Gurkhas and pay them very well um, to fight for the Brits. Um, and, um, and this is interesting because the Gurkha, you know, not only are they gonna, you know, financially make out very well, uh, but the Brits are going to use the Gurkha um, specifically to put down Indian resistance um, and Indian reform movements. When we get to Indian independence movement, we'll see that the Gurkha were instrumental in putting down um, a peaceful protest in Amritsar, and this eventually becomes known as the Amritsar Massacre. It's a really brutal event. Um, and so even though they are Nepalese, it's a different ethnicity, a very different history. They're all up in the, you know, the Himalayas. Hopefully you know where Nepal is. Um, they're still seen as South Asian, right? They're still seen as not British. And so it builds resentment when non-British people who are part of the Indian subcontinent are massacring other Indians in the name of the Brits. Um, this is very classic divide and conquer British policy. Um, it should also be noticed that the Gurkhas still serve the British Army today. I know there are multiple Gurkha brigades that are still stationed in Afghanistan, for example. Um, so, um, so this is kind of a long-standing alliance. Um, and here are some images that were floating around trying to get the Brits to be psyched on uh, Indian, um, the Indian colony and to move there. Um, so... Uh, here we have, these are illustrations trying to tell people that you're going to live a wonderful life if you move to India. Like, look at all the servants that you'll get. Um, and these servants probably, you know, were paid fairly well. It's better than working in a field. Um, and here we have a British um, migrant now living in India, um, loving all their servants, having his feet washed, but wearing these kind of cute Indian slippers in the process. So, like, look what an amazing life you can have in India. Um, here um, are Victorian women, um, or a Victorian family still having high tea um, in India. So, if you move to India, you can keep living your British life, but in this amazing, you know, landscape, and you can have all of these servants. And here, this servant is fanning this family by um, hanging a rug over top of the dining table and then pushing the rug back and forth in order to circulate air, which is interesting because God forbid the Brits wear more comfortable clothes that is suited for the environment. Instead, they're still wearing, um, you know, their high collared suits. The women are still wearing like corsets in the stifling Indian heat. Um, but you know, it's all about maintaining the British culture and what they thought was their cultural superiority over the Indians. Um, here we have, and I'm not sure exactly who all the players are, um, but a British 
um, official working alongside of two different Indian officials, right, who, um, you know, are still empowered, right? So the idea is that if we let some of these Indians continue to be in power and pay them handsomely and get them to do the British bidding, it makes it really difficult for the Indian populations to unite together um, to challenge the British government, right? So classic divide and conquer and manipulation, um, all for the benefit of the Brits. Um, one thing I kind of love about this painting, and it's a painting, um, is that this dude's desk is still so messy. Like, he could have, he didn't have to clean it. He could just told the artist to not show the mess, and yet he still did. And I don't know, I kind of connected that. Um, that said, I don't know, moving on. Um, and then here, I really like this image. So here we see a collection of Brits and Indians hanging out together, and they're actually gambling. There's a cockfight on the bottom of the painting. Um, and here, it's a, it can be difficult to tell, but we have a mixture of, as I said, Brits and Indians, and some of the Brits um, actually um, adopted Indian culture. Um, they were, were, were called the Orientalists, which is an outdated term, but it referred to uh, Brits who fell in love with Indian or sometimes other East Asian cultures. Um, and decided to adopt those so they might convert to a local religion and wear local dress. So this guy at the bottom is actually British, um, but he's wearing more Indian style clothing. He started to wear his hair both on his head and his facial hair um, in more traditional Indian styles instead of British ones. Um, so showing that some of this acculturation did go both ways, but it's generally going British to Indian, right? The Indians um, adopting some forms of um, British culture. So I want to take a second and introduce um, some concepts that we're going to apply to many of our um, colonial examples here. Um, and that is uh, accepting the idea that it's these relationships are not really that simple. It's not just Europeans versus Indians or Europeans versus South Africans. Um, there is a spectrum of indigenous imperial participation. And the inhabitants right, of these lands before the Europeans come fall somewhere on this line. And also, it might change in their lifetime, right? Exactly how they deal with the Europeans, right? What their role is. So we'll see that some members of these societies, and right now we're focusing on India, will be active in active rebellion, right? Always challenging the British government in some way or another. In the middle, and this is probably where most um, most individuals lie in this time period, that there are some matters of pragmatic compliance, that we're trying to make sure that our families survive, right? That we, we're hoping that this is a temporary moment. Um, or maybe they like some of the stuff that the Brits have brought, although a lot is troublesome because they're losing maybe um, grasp of their culture they're losing political power and whatnot. So I'd argue that most Indians and, you know, most colonial subjects are falling somewhere in between, right? Trying to take the good out of the situation, but recognizing that, um, that this is, is not good, that it is difficult, um, and does require some measures of resistance, or, whether overt or covert. Uh, but then we have those who are very compliant or complicit with um, in, uh, European rule, in this case, the British. Um, and that's a group that I've nicknamed the Imperial Pets, um, that the Europeans um, often identified as someone who might be very helpful, not only in helping to rule over the government, but in creating some sort of tension between groups that will make it impossible for these groups to unite together to fight against um, British rule. All right, so we need to keep our eye on where people might lie on this spectrum um, and all the different colonial situations that we study. Um, all right, so the Brits. Um, I guess we'll kind of focus on some of the quote-unquote advantages of British rule, um, if there are any. Uh, so, well, no, there are any, so excuse me for that. Um, we know at this point that the Brits were really advanced in a lot of scientific ways, and we know that the Indians were um, for most of history. Um, but the Brits and other Europeans are developing some new stuff, and they're going to bring that. So we will see the advantage of new medicines, of course, right to India. Um, the introduction of new schooling systems, and specifically the promotion of the English language. While it will lead to some language death, 
Um, there are some dozens of languages that were in, you know, smaller languages, but still were languages in India that disappear within about a hundred years um, because there are certain languages that are championed over others, you know, specifically like Bengali, um, Hindi, and Urdu. Um, will be preferred over some of the smaller dialects. And of course, English above all. If you want to work in the British Empire, if you want social mobility, you better learn English. Um, and that caused language death in this time period. But it also gets India ready to compete in the 21st century job markets because, of course, English becomes the lingua franca, right? becomes the language of business in most scenarios. So in the long term, we might be able to twist that and see that as an advantage. Um, the Brits helped to create a lot of infrastructure, um, which generally advantaged them, but you know everyone wins from that. Um, they'll bring in new food and new forms of food production, which can lead to a population boom, which is both good and bad. Um, we provide food security to certain parts of India. We'll also provide, or it will affect um, India negatively in making more food insecurity in some places. And at some point, a population boom is bad um, because overpopulation has its own sets of issues. Um, so just some images here to bring some of that to life. Uh, the railways um, can be seen as an advantage because it's connecting India and allowing people to move resources throughout the subcontinent. Um, these are pretty cool. So we're in this awesome age of um, of photography, which you know is so, so awesome that we were able to look right, at what we're studying now. Um, and this is a technology called a stereogram. Um, uh, it was kind of, some people call it like the Polaroid, right, of the Victorian era. And so it was an image that you would put um, in uh, this, this viewer um, that would make it look 3D. So that was kind of cool. And what I like about this is it's, um, you know, we're looking at this, this clash of time. In the back um, is the Bombay Railway Station, which looks like you know, very Victorian, very British. And then in the front of that, you know, we have a uh, kind of a rickshaw, right? Showing the old and the new forms of transportation. This is a map that looks at all the railways that were built by 1909. So really, really extensive network of railways, um, throughout India. So, um, you know, that's, that's generally a pretty good thing in terms of being able to move people around and the railways are still very important as a form of transportation in India. Um, the schools can be seen as an advantage or maybe as a disadvantage as well. Um, we should note that there definitely were schools in India before, um, but when the Europeans begin to build schools, they will offer it to more people. Um, but usually the lower classes only have access to mission schools, which though they provide excellent education, they of course come uh, with a requirement to take religious studies classes in Christianity, um, which could lead to conversion or at the very least um, challenge their sense of cultural autonomy. Um, but these mission schools, you know, did have a rigorous curriculum. Um, and if we know anything um, about the, the modern day, if we look at like college admittance rates of foreign um, students to the United States, you know, many times we are competing with Indian students, right? So the, the transformation of the educational system is one that did... Um, help a lot of people, right, make it a very competitive educational market. Um, they also opened uh, European-style universities, such as the University of Bombay and the University of Calcutta. I mean, these look like um, very typical schools that you might find within Europe um, and did have limited acceptance, and it usually would be of the upper class, um, usually Hindu Indians, uh, that would be admitted there. Um, but we are extending education, and that is often seen as a good thing. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, um, this guy, Gandhi, uh, I think it's super interesting, as I said before, to watch how someone's participation in this colonial experiment might change over time. And I think Gandhi is the perfect example of that. So Mohandas Gandhi, um, born in India, born Hindu, um, originally, if you look at his early life, seemed very pro-British. Um, here we see him, especially on the right very anglicized, right? So um, wearing the clothing and the style of Victorian England. He studied in London. He moved about the British Empire. Um, uh, here he is uh, in front of um, his office uh, in South Africa, right? And he was one of those uh, Indians that was very privileged in being asked um, to move to South Africa um, in order to, to work there. Um, as, as a lawyer, right? So he's doing quite well for himself within the British context. And he was, as I said, very pro-British. Um, pro um, 
sometimes people like to criticize Gandhi by bringing up some of the things that he wrote and said um, in his first days in South Africa, which could be seen as sometimes quite racist. Um, he sometimes was uh, fairly upset um, that he was denied certain rights because he was Indian and not white and would be offended that he would be asked to sometimes occupy uh, the same seats on a train as uh, black South Africans. Um, he kind of upheld the the perspectives of the time. Um, but of course, if, we, if you're not familiar with Gandhi, how? Um, and we will study him further. Um, but later in his life, he goes back on those statements, apologizes for them, and recognizes that he was a product of that time and product of that type of propaganda um, and the perspectives that the British were, were placing right, on all their colonial subjects to you know, hope that they will never see that they're all being oppressed in some way or another and organized against the British. Um, and then eventually Gandhi does become a major activist, not only for Indian independence, um, but, you know, for kind of racial and social equality. And of course, we'll, uh, we'll learn all of that later. Um, but even Gandhi uh, had been kind of sucked into uh, this, this privileged machine of the uh, British uh, kind of social hierarchies. All right, so here's like the super nasty stuff. Um, <clears throat> the disadvantages of British rule include obvious things such as major, sometimes loss of culture, um, that the, the idea that uh, Indian culture it was not as good as British culture, it right, becomes uh, very part and parcel of this sense of uh, culture, um, cultural imperialism. There's a lot of language death Right, so that's not good. Um, obviously, they've lost their sovereignty, and there's a great deal of political oppression. Where we're talking about people using force against Indians if ever they refuse to adhere to certain laws. Um, but another major issue is that in this era, um, we start to see famines that we had not really seen before. Um, and the transition from subsistence farming to cash cropping, and also um, with the change in um, and capital and capitalism, um, and with the growth of the speculative markets, creates whole new forms of poverty that India hadn't um, hadn't experienced before, right? So that stuff is going to be really difficult. Um, so here's a pattern that we need to watch for. When the Europeans begin to take over some of these regions, um, they will change their agriculture, um, and much of India, even though there were some big farms that. Uh, cultivated some things like cotton, the, mass, the vast majority of farms were still subsistence farming. And by, by this, we're talking about diverse farming that was generally small scale for the purpose of allowing that community to feed itself and to create its own resources. Um, and, and of course, it was very diverse in the types of crops that they would have, dozens of crops sometimes. Um, the Europeans will often force their colonial subjects to shift from small-scale subsistence farming to large-scale mono, monoculture cash cropping. And this is a serious problem because not only does it hurt the ecology, right, by leading to soil depletion, right, wrecking the soil, um, and the idea of monoculture is also really scary, as we've already discussed this year, um, because if we don't have a variety of crops, one blight can destroy the whole crop, and now we're really in trouble, so that's super scary. Um, but the other issue is that at some point, we're growing so many cash crops, like you know cotton, that we're not growing enough food. And if we're not growing enough food in India, how are we going to feed the people? So then some of the colonies of the Europeans begin to exist purely to grow some food to send to their cash cropping colonies, and the food that they're going to grow is probably going to be pretty nutrient um, poor. Uh, it's probably going to be a, just a couple types of crops, right? So they're not going to have a variety of nutrients that they're taking in. Um, and sometimes, too, the way that they import and manage those crops and this food um, creates scarcity. It's not a natural scarcity, but it creates it. Um, so there's a lot of really horrible stuff that's happening. And so some of the suffering that we see in India and some other places is just really, really wretched. Um, and it's very much um, a part of this transition from subsistence 
farming to cash cropping as well as some other stuff too, but let's take a look at this. So um, this is an example of cash cropping, serious ca cash cropping. Um, so um, uh, the island of Ceylon, now known as Sri Lanka, um, which was once a very diverse island, becomes known as essentially like a tea island, and the Lipton Tea Company begins to take that over for serious cash cropping. Um, so no longer a variety of things, just tea, 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 tea. And this is an ad for Lipton Tea. Um, and here we can see all the different ways they're trying to sell it um, to um, especially the British consumers, but also American consumers and other Europeans, right? So they're talking a big game here. Um, finest the world can produce, rich and fragrant, etc. And then if you look at the imagery here, yes, we can see some Indians working, um, but it looks really idyllic, right? This looks like a beautiful tropical land. And these people are out in this beautiful weather, working, working, right? We're not seeing, you know, A, uh, how difficult this work is, and also B, that yes, like now we might be making lots of tea, um, but at what cost if we don't have a, a diversity in our um, uh, in our cropping here? Um, so cotton and indigo are some of the big cash crops, and here we see some imagery um, uh, from um, a really important document, an expose that comes out that is showing that you know not everything was you know beautiful. Um, if you can look here at this imagery. Um, by this guy Digby. Um, here we have some Indians working up top, which you know looks like hard work. Um, here we have some Indians still working, and we can also note there's some kids kind of just playing in these bushes while the families are working. Um, they're looking kind of thin, and here we have some Indians carrying uh, one of the British imperial overseers in a sedan chair. So that's a little creepy. Um, so it's just like indicating that things might not be so idyllic, so beautiful as that Ceylon tea. But what we're also we're looking at here is that these cash crops and um, other uh, other crops, food crops, um, are no longer just being sold based on uh, basic supply and demand. But now we have uh, changed the market to include speculation um, to figure out what will the price be in the long term. Um, so we're kind of playing with stock market ideas. Um, and what that does is it messes with the prices. And even if rich people might be able to deal with that and make money off of that, um, prices get so crazy, they fluctuate so wildly that it really begins to hurt the poor. Um, and so this is looking at the quote unquote, the two Indias, um, the India that is, uh, that is suffering and starving. Um, and the India that is doing quite well, because of course there were, there were still those Indians that did quite well, such as the Tata family. Uh, the Tata family, um, under Jamsechi Tata, um, he was already uh, kind of a very rich, well-to-do, noble Indian, um, who the British worked with to transition what were his cotton fields to um, other uh, industries, you know, as they were burgeoning as we entered the 20th century. So he's known as the father of Indian industry. Tata Motors is still a major industry today, um, making cars. Um, this is from the Daily Telegraph um, in uh, 1927, um, showing at Tata Sons, you know, limited um, their cotton mills, their iron and steel works, um, their beautiful hotel in Bombay, um, their coal industry, the amazing dam that he created, right? So here we have an industrialist that absolutely did quite well under British rule with their subsidies, with their help, and of course on his own as well. But then we have this stuff too. Um, and here we have uh, some of the shocking photographs that are coming about in this time period, looking at um, those that didn't do so well on their Brits that were dying in these serious famines um, that uh, happened multiple times under British rule. Um, and one of the main journalists uh, to um, uncover some of the deep-seated um, issues in India, specifically these famines, is William Digby. Um, in his expose, The Famine Campaign in Southern India, Volumes 1 and 2. So first, um, I want us to note his title, The Famine Campaign, right? So he's not saying the famine or the tragedy, the unexpected famines but that the Brits campaigned, that they orchestrated these, these famines in some way or another. Um, one of the first etchings in his book um, is this one, um, titled Grain Bags on Madras Beach. 
February 1877. So it's showing, you can see as far as the eye can see, there's grain bags, all sorts of wheat and rice. So there is food in southern India, right? And yet we have famine. Um, and here we see these images of, um, uh, of cattle death. When animals begin to starve to death, that is bad. Um, that is showing that that is that, that region is going to take um, a generation right to rebound from this. Um, here we see an image. You can see two children who've been abandoned. Um, I know it's really difficult for you to see, but the um, title of the image is called Forsaken. Right, so they have families who are just like abandoning children in the depths of this horrible famine. Um, and these are some numbers um, so we can see just how bad these famines were. Um, and depending on who is reporting, numbers might change a little bit. Um, so the famine from 1876 to 1879, Digby reported as much as 10.3 million people starved um, in India. Uh, and the Savoy um, uh, reported 6.1 million. So whoever's right, that's a ton of people. The 1896 to 1902 um, famines, uh, the Lancet estimated 19 million people in India starved to death. Um, the Cambridge Review, 6.1 million. So anywhere between 12 to almost 30 million people um, dying between 76 and 1902 in India. Right, Really scary stuff. In China, we'll see similar major issues um, of famine. Uh, Brazil also. Um, Brazil, for a couple reasons, um, even though they're not under colonial rule necessarily, um, there's some ecological issues or some weather pattern stuff I'll explain, as well as um, the choice to export some of their food, um, divert it from the people who might need it, the poor who might need it to make money um, and sell it to the Brits and the Germans and the French um, so that they could feed their um, colonial subjects um, on the cheap, right? So this is a serious period of famine. Um, and what I want us to look at is how much wheat was being exported to the UK in the years of these famines. So in particular, 1877, and if we go back, um, then one of the main famines was between 1876 and 1879. And this table shows us that between 1876 and 1877, the Brits doubled how much um, uh, Indian wheat was exported to the UK, right? So while the Indians were starving, all this wheat was going into um, England, um, creating this famine, or creating this great amount of suffering. And then also, if you look where the famines are, um, there's intense famine in, in southern India, um, intense and severe famine in parts of northern India. Um, but it's quite interesting, right, that the places closest to the seats of government where most of the Brits lived, there is no famine, right? So that is definitely a, you know, a curious um, spread, right, of famine. All right, so why such rampant famines, right? Much of this I've already explained, um, such as the transition from crash, uh, subsistence farming to cash cropping um, uh, meant that we're making less food. We also have serious land mismanagement, which leads to soil depletion, that even when they try to grow some food, they can't do so. Um, there's also the unfortunate uh, coupling of these El Nino weather patterns that did lead to some severe flooding and droughting, which just added insult to injury. But the big thing is how the economy has changed. So no longer are we just simply pricing food and other goods based on basic supply and demand, but the growth of the stock market meant that, um, that speculation affected the price and speculating how much a crop or a resource might do on these growing stock markets might hike the price of that good to the point where the poor couldn't afford it anymore. Um, and also, they could no longer pay their taxes or pay for these goods in any way they wanted. They had to pay as the British asked them to, right, in their currency. Um, and so now we've created a form of poverty that didn't really exist before. People might have been pretty poor, but they could have at the very least generally housed themselves and fed themselves. And now they can't do that because they can't begin to pay what the market price is of these goods. Um, they might not be able to you know, get the British form of currency. They could maybe barter, and of course some people did that to survive, um, but we've created a form of poverty 
that simply didn't exist before. Also because this transition from um, supply and demand based pricing as well as um, requiring a certain form of currency happened really quickly. Throughout Europe, that type of shift happened really slowly, allowing the lower classes to slowly adjust, and even they struggled getting used to that. Imagine in less than a generation, the market in India changed overnight, like so quickly. How do you begin to scramble right, to make that work? Um, and, uh, and, and the, the negative effects, um, as we saw, were famine and were, are, is poverty. Um, like we haven't seen before. So that gap between the rich and the poor grows exponentially. Um, and of course, the other issue is that there's grain, there's stuff um, that they could have given to the Indians, and we'll see this play out in other colonies as well. But instead, the British and other groups prioritize sending that grain to their other colonies who might be doing other work they can profit off of, um, or to England or America, whoever else might need it. All right, so we need to watch out for this pattern. All right, that was very long. Um, sorry, but also not sorry. Uh, so um, we will move on to another part of the world. Bye.